Now we're Atlanta Hawks, haven't won an NBA title since we were the St. Louis Hawks back in 1958. Worse, fans nationally don't follow us on TV like they did the Cubs and the Red Sox when they broke their curses. Hey, Sids, we're the CNN of basketball. Hi, everyone. This is Will O'Toole for Park Ridge Sports History again, welcoming you to another edition. This week, I'd like to talk everything NBA. And uh, getting into the playoffs as we are, first round action occurred last week with kind of like the play-in games, but now we get serious with uh, the teams. Here's the deal. And once again, I'd like to thank Howard for doing everything that he does for me in terms of making this look somewhat, somewhat presentable. But each week, you know, we 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 kind of uh, Howard gets in touch with me. He says, "Hey, hey, Will, I just saw this. I just saw this. This one I was just thinking of." And I was not a Nick fan, but I was thinking about the old Atlanta Hawks. And of course, I grew up with uh, Pete Maravich and Lou Hudson. And of course, on previous episodes, I did show Lou Hudson and some of uh, Pete Maravich's basketball cards. And then I was thinking about the Hawks. And they have never done anything for me, the Hawks. You know how you have certain teams in either the NFL or the NBA or Major League Baseball or even hockey, they just don't do anything one way or another to you. In fact, uh, the less they do for you, kind of like the more you loathe them. Like I was never a big Sixer fan. I love Dr. J. I wish he had never played for the Sixers, but I did root for them or I had an interest in them when they played both the uh, Trailblazers the first year that uh, Irving was in the NBA. And of course, then as he was getting near the end, I wanted to see him win an NBA title because I thought he was just such a great, great, great player. And he was uh, did play in the ABA, which I loved. And I've recounted how uh, that 76 semifinals, uh, the New York Nets against the San Antonio Spurs, it's, it's, still, uh, it's still emblazoned in my mind as just a great series. Larry Keenan and, and Dr. J and Billy Paltz here from Bergen County by way of Riverdale and uh, in Ordell. But uh, there are just, getting back to the Hawks, there are just certain teams that never just did anything for me. And the Hawks actually were like that. In baseball, I guess a team that just never did anything for me uh, were the Giants, maybe the Astros, maybe in the American League, probably like, uh, I don't know, maybe the Orioles. In, in the NFL, teams that never just did anything for me one way or the other, probably a team like Miami, uh, maybe the old Baltimore Colts. Well, I'll take that back. I was really mad at the Colts when they beat the Cowboys, and I was a big Cowboy fan way back when. So I guess I do have some issues with that, those Colt teams. But really, um, I, I'm just trying to think of another team. Uh Maybe the Los Angeles Rams, never one way or another about them. And, of course, in the NBA, I have to put the Hawks in there. And perhaps, I don't know, another team, uh, probably the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, nothing really, they never did anything for me. Anyway, with the Knicks playing the Hawks and growing up uh, during the age of the Knicks, I had three things I wanted to research this week. And one was, just like I did with the NHL, I was thinking about the teams with the best record in the NBA. How often have they gone on during the regular season to cop the NBA championship? And I was actually amazed. It happened uh, actually more than I realized. And then I was thinking this, really less than I thought. Because in the NBA, and it's gone probably back and forth on this. They used to give you home field advantage for the best regular season title. Sometimes they would alternate between the West and the East and all the rest of it. NHL, probably the same. NFL, not really, because the Super Bowl is at a neutral uh, site. And in the NFL playoffs, way back in the 60s, there was like a designated. It wasn't didn't go to the team with the better record. Uh, 
And that's why uh, I was thinking about this. If you take a look at 69 with the Browns and the Cowboys, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, the Cowboys had the better record, yet they lost in Cleveland in mud. It's great if you ever want to watch on YouTube. As an eight-year-old kid, I'm mortified that they lost. <laughs> And we're hammered in the playoff game. Anyway, getting back again to the Hawks, I was thinking about the Hawks this way. They have actually been around since the beginning of the NBA. Now, they weren't always in Atlanta. They did play in St. Louis. And I also didn't realize this. They played for a few seasons in Milwaukee and also in Tri-Cities. You know, you have to remember, I was talking to my brother Jim just before I got on the air. And we love the minor leagues. My brother really does love the minor leagues. And he always got a kick out of the fact that here is the NBA, big corporate uh, world, and all the teams are basically in big corporate center metropolitan areas. And yet many of the beginnings of both the NFL, the NBA, and to a certain extent, even baseball, they began in smaller, real blue collar towns. I mean, it really sees its... Uh, Really, you can see that in the Green Bay Packers as the last of the small blue-collar towns that had professional franchises. You know, Providence had a number of teams in both football, basketball, and uh, I believe in, um, in hockey as well, way back when. But they had, uh, they had teams called, like you know, the Pistons started in Fort Wayne. I don't think Fort Wayne would ever get a franchise today, obviously with the Indianapolis or the Indiana Pacers playing in Indianapolis, but you would never see a team like Fort Wayne getting a franchise today. They did way back when, and the Hawks were no different. They started in Tri-Cities, then moved to Milwaukee, stayed there for a few years, then moved to St. Louis, where probably you could argue they had their greatest success and then moved to Atlanta, oh, about the middle of the 60s, maybe even a little bit uh, sooner, maybe about 1965, 66. Never were, never really had a strong base. You know, that has always been a problem with Atlanta. And that is, they don't really have a, you would think with the success of the Braves over the last 25 years, that they would grow like a national base, particularly since Turner had been putting them on TBS, had been broadcasting them nationwide via the satellite. They even did a special treat on Wednesday afternoons, if you recall, way back in the early 80s, where they used to have games start at 530, not afternoon games, but 535 games. And it was very interesting. I wish baseball would kind of bring that back because it was kind of cool. So you could come home and watch a whole game, have it over by 8 o'clock and still be able to do something or maybe even 7.30. And you wouldn't miss, let's say, you wouldn't have to uh, play hooky from work or play hooky from school. You could watch the Braves on Wednesday afternoons at 5.35 if they had a home game. So they did a lot of interesting things, but they are probably one team. Or, or one city that's really never grown a fan base. Like the Cubs, like the Red Sox, like the Yankees, like the Dodgers, like the Lakers, like the Celtics. Uh, and I could go on and on and on and on. You know, and then I'm not even talking about football. Even the Falcons don't have a Falcon nation nationwide, like the Cowboys, the Packers, the Bears, or the Bears. Even now, the Patriots have become more of a national uh, team. But for the most part, the Hawks have been very parochial. And even very parochial, <laughs> the pews haven't been filled to uh, capacity. Because uh, really, the Hawks, outside of the 58 season, have given nothing to their fans, far and few, to root for. How do I know that? Well... As my cartoon has stated, they haven't won since 1958. And here's the thing. You know, we talk about, I did a, a cartoon earlier about the Indians not winning since 48. They become, you know, the next thing after the Cubs, the White Sox in 2006, ending their long uh, drought. Uh, the Red Sox with the curse of the Bambino, the Cubs with the curse of the Goat, finally ending theirs in 2016. Even the Astros winning. 
you know, uh, since their uh, inaugural season of 1962, had never sniffed a championship. And here they ended theirs as well. Even to a certain extent, the Dodgers ending 30 years uh, of really futility. And then here are the Hawks. And nobody talks about them. And yet they've won in 1958. That was their last thing. They've gone completely, completely into the dark, just like my computer just did now. I have to think I have to change the sleep mode on it. Uh, so I'm going to have to holler to my son later and tell him. But that Hawk team in 58, before I, I wax poetic about that 58 team, and I have to tell you this too, the Hawks have really never done anything uh to commemorate that team. You know, back in 2018, that would be 60 years or 2008 would have been 50 years. I never recall seeing a patch celebrating that team or maybe even bringing back some of the players uh, from that squad. And in fact, here are the players from that squad. Um, kind of not the great, not a bad uniform, nothing to write home to. They kind of look like, I don't know, the local high school uh, team that you have. And this is no knock event against the Bergen County high schools and stuff, but that looks like a high school uniform. They even look like a high school team, <laughs> right? And this is the 50s. But they did have, as my picture underneath, they had some great players on that team. Cliff Hagen. They had uh, Bob... Petite, I used to call him, but Bob Pettit. And they had Big Ed McCauley. All right. These are, uh, and this is what I love, Ed McCauley right here. I love the back. But anyway, six foot nine, a broken rib didn't slow Easy Ed down one bit last year. He continued to float one-handers through the nets with amazing accuracy. Ed is one of three players in pro history to score over 10,000 points and has made the all-star team four times. His high for one game is 46 points. Number of things you can glean from that little bio is this. Quite a few guys have passed 10,000 points in their career. In fact, I've actually made, uh, uh, I've actually done a metrics thinking that if LeBron James can play until he's about 40, and believe me, he's in great shape. And even if he just averages 12 points as a spot player, because I think he could still be productive that way at the age of 40 because he's such a great athlete, he could wind up with 50,000 points. And here, this basketball card is touting the fact he's one of four players to score over 10,000 points in his career. Definitely, you can see the beginnings of uh, a billion-dollar industry right there on that card. Not only that but it says his high is 46 points. Well, that soon has been bested. Uh, obviously, Will Chamberlain's 100 points in 62. It's still uh, the one mark that hasn't been broken in the NBA, but you had David Thompson score over 70 points, Michael Jordan, and a number of other players score 60 points in a game. Kobe, I think, had 68 one night uh, years ago. So you, you're, you're talking about them not just beating that, 46 points, but really just uh, uh, just making it vanish, go away. 46, that's just a pedestrian Hall of Fame scoring mark for some of the players today. But that Hawk team, here's the interesting thing I found out about the Hawks. Well, let me just say this. They start off, and I mentioned this in another podcast, but I forgot to mention this as well. You know, that Hawk team really had – the beginnings of maybe becoming the dynasty or maybe the team that all other NBA teams would be graded against. And why do I say that? Well, they had Red Holtzman as one time as their coach when they were in Milwaukee. And then they also had a guy by the name, another Red, Red Orbach, who came from Washington where he started his pro coaching career and came for one season with, uh, with the uh, Atlanta, uh, not the, with the Tri-City Hawks. This is at the very beginnings 
of the NBA. Actually, Red Holtzman coached him for three years. They were never over uh, 500 with him. But here's the deal. Um, getting it right now. In 1949-1950, the Tri-City Blackhawks, and they have an Indian chief headdress, kind of like, well, it's not like the Chicago Blackhawks, more like the old Boston Redskins uh, logo. But they had Roger Potter, who they fired after seven games. He was one in six. And then they bring in Red Orbach, who finished 28 and 29. So obviously he improved the club. They do make the semifinals and they lose. This is going to be one of my brother's favorite uh, uh, teams in the old NBA. They beat the Anderson, and I believe they were from Indiana, the Anderson Packers. And uh, they lost them in the semifinals uh, two games to one. Well, the following year, they get rid of Orbach. He goes to the Celtics. And, of course, we know what he does with the Celtics. Leads them to a number of NBA titles. Of course, he's able to draft Bill Russell, gets John Havlicek and all the rest of it. And that leads me to another uh, segue into Red Orbach. I was looking at his history of drafts with the Celtics. And I thought it was going to be awe-inspiring over the number of selections, who he selected, what nugget uh, did he find underneath a rock that just became, you know, the diamond in the rough. Uh, what player he found that was just, wow, I can't believe it. But actually, Red's record in drafting. Now, you got to remember this, too, in the NBA. It was regionalized. So you had kind of a commitment from certain schools in your area. That's why they got so many Holy Cross players like Tommy Heinsohn and Bob Cousy, uh, the Celtics. That's why uh, um, I, I think Seton Hall, many of their players went to the old Rochester Royals, which are today the Sacramento Kings. So there was some uh, 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 regionalization of the draft picks. And it was the spur interest. It was kind of, you know, you root for the local boy at Holy Cross. You want to see him play for the professional team here. So it kept a, a network of interest and all the rest of it. To wit, though, he does draft Havlicek in 62. And he does, of course, draft Russell. Probably a no-brainer. All right. And, you know, after he drafts Russell, the franchise, the fortunes of the whole team turn around. And he uh, – but he does – Engineer a trade, which equates to a draft picks and gets Larry Bird, all right, for the 80 or 81 season. Of course, my memory is, is well, 79 for the 79-80 season. Pardon me. He gets Bird. He does engineer a trade for Robert Parrish. He does uh, sign Danny Ainge. Like I said, he gets uh, Bailey Howe, who kind of helped him out in the, in the 60s. But does draft Charlie Scott, does draft JoJo White, does draft Dave Cowens. These are integral players for the championships that he has in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. My whole point is this, though. I thought that Red was probably going to draft these guys and say, wow, how did he get a hold of these guys? But for every great player that he drafted, Havlicek, he gets some so-so guys, guys you never heard of. They're not as good as you think, but he does make some astute trades. Like I said, he gets Robert Parrish, and maybe that's where the real brilliance is for uh, Red Orbach is not so much drafting players out of college, but finding those necessary parts that's going to win you championships. Perfect example, Don Nelson, who was a real thorn in the side <laughs> of Nick fans. I remember they used to make fun of his – push foul free throws. They were kind of unorthodox, but boy, he had a pretty good percentage. Uh, he signed him after uh, Nelson, uh, you know, spent his career uh, elsewhere. He trades for Paul Silas, gets him. He trades uh, Paul Westfall and gets Dennis, uh, Dennis Johnson. How did I forget his name? Uh, not Magic Johnson, Dennis Johnson. He gets him in a deal. He did sign Danny Ainge. I don't know whether the Celtics uh, had drafted him, and then he goes to baseball, and then he comes back, or he, he traded for his rights, whatever. But he does get a serviceable part there. 
you know, he brings in Bill Walton at the uh, end of his career. So my whole point is I think Red made some really good tactical moves, uh, getting players who would just really uh, deepen his bench. Uh, I'm even thinking of Bailey Howell uh, and other players like that. But in terms of a draft, he was kind of, you know, I would say C plus, B minus. And if you add in Havlicek and Russell and Cowens, now it goes up to like a B plus, maybe. I'm going to say B plus. I'm going to be tough on him. And, uh, and of course, Bird and all the rest. Listen, those are three great players. But my whole point is, I think everyone can see the talent in those players. What I was looking for was, did Red find talent in other players in the draft? And really the answer is, eh. But he does spot talent that he knows would mesh well with the talent he already had. That's a huge play too. Because now you're bringing in vets. Paul Silas, who I actually, I, I love Silas. He was Dennis Rodman for Dennis Rodman was Dennis Rodman. And that is this. No, he wasn't that crazy caricature that Rodman came into. But he was that tough, blue-collar worker, a great rebounder, particularly an offensive rebounder who had a lot of garbage points by putting him, you know, the putback uh, offensive rebound, number 35. He was just a great, great player that way. Maybe not Hall of Fame, probably overlooked, but he's a guy you win with. And he did all of uh, the necessary work needed to win. I love Silas. And he got him basically from the Phoenix Suns, a team that they would play in the 76 NBA Finals. He stole them from the Suns. Yeah, he was kind of considered an aging vet out of Creighton, but he still had, I would say, I think they got him in, I'm going to say 71 or 72. So they got about five years of great play from um uh, you know, Paul Silas. And of course, like I said, Bailey Howe, uh, Hall of Famer, uh, came to the Celtics late like the Asian vet off the bench, 8, 10 quality points, 15 quality minutes each game would help them uh, win a couple of uh, titles as well. Uh, he does get, uh, I'm just trying to think who else he picked off. I, I mentioned he signed Don Nelson. He picks up, of course, uh, Bill Walton, Signs a couple other players. I'll give you one guy. He, he got Scott Wedman, who played for the Kings. Good player. I think he made an all-star team. He was uh, – Wedman played with Tiny Archibald, who also played with the Celtics. So uh, Wedman comes to the uh, Celtics. I do believe he wins a championship. I know they played in a couple of titles with Wedman coming off the bench. These are the kind of players that he just added and said, oh, I – you know, I can get a couple more years at him. The Rick Carlisles. Um, I, I'm just going through one li list here. Uh, Rick Carlisle, uh, Greg Kite, who did a nice job off the bench. You're not winning with him if he's your starter. I'm not saying that. But he gave you quality minutes off the bench. And it always seemed, you put him in the uh, Celtic green, and green, gold, and white, little tinge of gold. Anyway, we're the green and white of the Celtics. And it was like a rebirth, a resurrection for some of these players who were just, you know, going to end it all, uh, their careers and all the rest of it. But getting back, here's Alex. Uh, well, Red Orbach is an Atlanta Hawk. Excuse me. He's a Tri-City Hawk. And then he leaves and goes to the Celtics. Who knows what would have happened had you kept Red in Boston. Now, mind you, I'm knocking Red's picks, but I, I'm just kind of adding a little bit uh, a different perspective. The guy flat out was the quintessential winner in uh, the NBA. I mean, nine, nine some odd titles, another half dozen as a GM. Uh, I think he had uh, a, a great perspective on the game, loved to run, thought defense was important, all the rest. Uh, imagine if the Hawks had just held on to red and the other red as well, because Holtzman wins two titles with the Knicks. And for the, for the most part, uh, Holtzman joins the Knicks. You know, this is a franchise that never won. And then Holtzman wins two championships in three years. He wins 70 
And well, actually, 70 and 73 wins two championships in four years, but gets to the finals another time and loses to the Lakers. So that was the glory years before uh, Patrick Ewing comes aboard. And Red is really one of the brains behind that. I, I, you, you can't deny that. And these are two quality coaches that the Hawks had, that had they held on to them, maybe they wouldn't be losing 43 straight playoffs. And here's what I'm, I'm looking at. Here were the Atlanta Hawks in 56-57, they lose to the Celtics in the finals. Okay? But they get revenge and beat the Celtics in the finals the next year. Their one and only championship. And from there on, it's been a desert. <laughs> it's been barren. It has been a wasteland for the Hawks, whether they were in St. Louis or Atlanta. They uh, actually made the playoffs every year from 57 all the way to 1973, all right? And here's who they lost to. They lost to the Celtics three of four years. Uh, in the other finals that they make, of course, they do beat the Celtics for the titles. Here's the interesting thing. That was the only year that uh, Russell lost in the championship, I do believe, because – uh, uh, Bill Russell was the rebound leader with a 22.7. So it was the only time that Russell lost a championship while in the NBA. I mean, he won two as a player coach. He was incredible. Won nine championships, I believe, in all. But that 57-58 uh, Hawk team, they defeat the Celtics, and then it's been downhill since because they've lost eight times in addition to the first meeting in 57 to the Celtics. In fact, I have a list of the 43 playoff losses or the 43 years that have ended with their final series being a playoff loss. I didn't calculate uh, or I didn't compile all the teams that they've played in the playoffs, but I will tell you this. The teams that have knocked them out the most are the Celtics, who have beaten them nine out of ten times, the Lakers, who have beaten them four times, the Washington-Baltimore Bullets, who have beaten them four times, and here's an interesting one. The Indiana Pacers have beaten them four times to send them packing for the end of the season. That one year, though, let's talk about that 57-58 season. As I said, they had Big Ed McCauley, Bob Pettit, and... Cliff Hagen as probably their top three players on that team. Even that Hawk, I will say this, not that I like the Hawk uniform, but at least this looked very similar to the ones that they had in the 80s. But like I said, this Hawk team looks like a high school team, and that looks like a yearbook picture. You know, varsity, 1958-59 of, you know, uh, Maple, Maple Town, USA, or something like that. And then, of course, Ed McCall. I love the background on this. Alex Hanman, though, was their coach. He was 41 and 31 that year. He is a Hall of Famer. And um, he actually played in the NBA. And here's the deal with him he's kind of interesting because he wins that NBA championship, then goes to Syracuse and coaches up there for three years, then moves on to the Warriors when they move to San Francisco. All right, for, they moved to San Francisco. Uh, I believe they moved for the 63-64 season. He goes 48-32 and 32 his first year. Then the bottom drops out. He's 17-63. and 63. And then gets one more opportunity with the Warriors Goes 35 and 45 before Philadelphia, the 76ers, pick him up and he promptly wins a championship uh, with the Philadelphia 76ers. And of course, they had Will Chamberlain on that team. They had Chet Walker and all the rest of it. That was a team that I believe beat the Celtics in the semis. They finally got over the hump. Chamberlain finally defeats uh, uh, Bill Russell. In fact, 
I just want to go back. That team had on its squad, yeah, ready for this. It's one of the great teams of all time. Will Chamberlain, Larry Costello, who would go on to coach and win the NBA title with the Milwaukee uh, Bucks, I almost said Brewers, and Lou Alcindor, who is now known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. They had Billy Cunningham, of course, North Carolina Tower Heel, who would coach the 76ers for many years. Actually, I believe it was Cunningham. Uh, I think it was Cunningham who was the coach of the 82-83 team, if I do recall. Uh, let me just check. The only Right now, I'm just looking at his... Let me just go back here and let me just check something with, with the uh, 76ers. They won, I do believe it was Billy Cunningham who was their coach in 82-83. Yes, it was. He went 65-17. and 17. Uh, They win the whole thing, beat the Lakers. So Cunningham was also a guy who wins a championship with the team, and then wins an NBA. And, of course, i got to do that now, too. The number of players who have won titles as a coach and as a player, because right off the top of my head, Pat Riley, Bill Russell, uh, Sanders, Sam Jones. I, I can just name uh, a few right there. I believe Bill Sharman with the Lakers. So you're talking about a number of players that went from the, from the court to the bench to win a title. Well, Alex Hannon was a Hall of Fame coach. Here's the deal with him, though, and this is what I did like about Hannon. After he wins with the Sixers in 67, and the executive of that team, as I'm looking at basketball reference, another great spot was um, Jack Ramsey, Dr. Jack Ramsey, who would win a title with Portland. But Alex Hammond, ready for this? He leaves the Sixers after the 68 season and jumps to the ABA. And in his first season with Oakland and his only season as a coach in the ABA, he wins a championship. And I believe that Oakland Oaks team had a guy by the name of Rick Barry. And of course, that team, I do believe, was owned or partial ownership by um, Pat Boone. But anyway, getting back to the Hawks, they have lost 43 uh, straight years in the playoffs. They haven't even sniffed uh, a championship uh, game, no less a title in all those times. And their overall record, I did do this prior because they are, uh, as I went taping today, they are up two games to one against the Knicks, which would be the first time if they do hold on and defeat the Knicks in the playoff round, that would be, uh, well, I shouldn't say it would be the first time that they beat the Knicks, but they, uh, the Knicks have sent them packing twice. So it would be uh, fun for the Atlanta Hawks to turn the, uh, you know, turn it around and send the Knicks packing. But overall, ready for this, the Hawks. Now this covers all of their playoff rounds. They are 150 and 200 in their overall playoff history in um, in the NBA playoffs. But Alex Hannon, who was their coach, goes on and goes to the Oakland Oaks and wins the championship in the inaugural season of the ABA. Guys on that team, I remember, of course, Rick Barry. I do remember a guy by the name of Doug Moe, who is not so much a successful coach, didn't win a title, I believe, but man, he was around for quite some time. I remember him coaching the uh, Nuggets and having a high octane offense, no defense. And we'll get into that too, because uh, I also did a little study on the teams that have won the NBA championship who have been either the leader in scoring during a regular season or the leader in defense during uh, the regular season, or both. And actually, that's the surprising thing. And I'll get into that uh, in a second. Warren Jabali, I do remember him. He was also known as Warren Armstrong. And I do believe, I want to say, no, he didn't play. He just played pretty much in the ABA. But I do remember him. 
Uh, Andrew Anderson from Canisius. These are guys from the old Oakland Oaks basketball team. Of course, their big star was Rick Barry. Here's the interesting thing. I think Barry was the last player selected from the University of Miami before the Hurricanes suspended their basketball um, program and then brought it back and joined the uh, – became an independent and then joined the Big East in the early – uh, in the late eighties, early nineties. And we're in the, uh, uh, big East for a while playing college basketball. Of course, now they're in the ACC. Another player on that Oakland Oaks team. Ready? Uh, Larry Brown. And of course, Larry Brown would lead a number of teams, uh, in the NBA to, uh, titles and all the rest. And in fact, here's the thing with Brown. I believe he is the only one to lead a team to an NBA title and also an NCAA title. And I also think uh, Olympic as well. Let me just see something with Larry Brown. This is all coming over. Again, this is all a result of this whole segment on the history of the uh, Atlanta Hawks in the playoffs. Larry Brown, University of Kansas, wins a championship with Danny Manning. Coached the Spurs, the Clippers, the Pacers, the Sixers, the Pistons, the Knicks. Was in the front office with the Sixers, the Hornets. Went to Southern Methodist uh, <laughs> and coached uh, not only there but also abroad. And uh, it, it just an amazing thing. ABA champion, 1969 with, of course, the Oakland Oaks, uh, three-time ABA All-Star. He was, as a coach, NBA champion. He coached ABA Coach of the Year, NCAA champion. Oh, that's it. Okay. So he won both an NCAA championship with Kansas and then an NBA champion with, I believe, the Detroit Pistons, if I am correct. Okay. The NBA uh, champion, I believe, was the Detroit Pistons. They finished second. Uh, yes, they beat the Lakers. So it was with the Pistons. So Larry Brown. But Alex Hannon, pretty good career, right? Brings the Hawks their first championship. Pretty unbelievable as well. And the Hawks, of course, still looking for their first title since 57-58. And one thing before I go... And that is this. I was looking, as I stated, about offense and defense, teams that have won championships and all the rest of it that have gone on uh, uh, to win. There's been only one team, and that's the 1960 Boston Celtics, that have led the league in scoring and led the league in defense and then won the NBA championship. Now, the Celtics were in an eight-club uh, uh association then with the NBA. It's expanded quite uh, quite a bit since then. But really, when I was going through all this, not too often does the number one te team in offense win. I think the last time it happened, of course, was the Warriors. Or, yeah, was the Warriors. Uh, they, in 2018, led the league in scoring but we're 18th in defense and yet won in 2018. And of course they led in scoring in 2017 and 2015. Actually their 2017 was not just first in scoring, but fourth in defense. Not too bad. Uh, the last team to win the whole thing that was first in defense was the San Antonio Spurs in 2007. Pretty remarkable. Pretty much I will tell you this, outside of really Golden State being 18 in a 30 team, there haven't been too many teams in the bottom. The only other team I'm looking at, the Lakers in 2001 were 29th last in defense in terms of giving up points uh, out of 29 teams. I'm going to check that later, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm accurate with that. The 2001 Lakers were 29th. Let me just check that real quick 
They were 23rd of 29 in defense. That 2001, they beat the Lakers, uh, they beat the Sixers, and of course, then they beat the Nets in 2002. Interestingly enough, for a team that was 23rd or 23 of 29 in defense, they ripped right through the playoffs, going a stellar 12 and 1 with their only loss to the Philadelphia 76ers in the NBA championship. Everyone, thank you for joining me again. This is Will O'Toole for Park Ridge Sports History. I'll have another episode next week. Thank you again for joining me.